start the recording and uh, hand it over to Alex. All right, thank you, thank you, Mike. Uh, so I am going to share my screen so you don't have to look at this loud shirt and we'll get started. Okay, um, hopefully you guys see that okay. Uh, so the uh, title of the talk is about uh, making things small. You know, what, uh, how, do you, how do you create scale in particular in something like an animated uh, film? So, um, so uh, the, way, the way I got started uh, on this particular topic was a few years ago, uh, DreamWorks still had a studio in Northern California and I was doing consulting uh, with them and they were just starting their uh, first uh, Trolls movie. Uh, and I, I knew some of, the, some of the folks there in the, in the production and they asked me, well, uh, we want to have the audience engaged in this world of the Trolls and the Trolls are supposed to be about four inches tall. So they're uh, little, little creatures. And um, to convince the audience about the world, um, you know, what, what would it be like if you were a troll? And, and what would the world be like? And, and um, what's, what's different in the world if you're four inches tall uh, as opposed to you know, a normal human size? So uh, I put together a bunch of research uh, on this general question, and I presented all of that to the crew of the of talk is just. Um, collection of some of those, some of those uh, ideas. So. Now, uh, in, a, in a movie, uh, when you are trying to establish the size of something, uh, well, there's one way to do it, which is to uh, show something next to something of a known size. So like in these two posters uh, for How to Train Your Dragon, uh, the poster on the left, it doesn't really indicate the scale of the dragon. Uh, but the poster on the right uh, shows you that, well, uh, the dragon, uh, Toothless, he's about the size, uh, you know, bigger than uh, people. So, you know, it gives you the sense that he's like the size of a large cow. Maybe. Now, uh, you can't always put uh, two objects right next to each other. So uh, you also have to have visual cues for distance. So there's, there's a bunch of different visual cues that tell you uh, whether something is close to you or far away. Um, and here's a, a list of the um, major ones. Uh, so there's occlusion, which is things which are closer to you block your view of things that are farther away. Uh, geometric perspective, as discovered in, in the Renaissance, about how to um, make people in the background the right size as you would see them in real life. Uh, atmospheric perspective, uh, discovered by uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, light and shadow gives you a sense of uh, distance. Uh, you can create trompe d'oeil like in this image. Uh, focus, depth of field, um, parallax, things in the distance don't move as far when you um, yourself move. Uh, stereopsis, which is 3D, uh, of course. And uh, there were a few of these visual cues that were used in the film uh, Trolls. Uh, one of the main ones was uh, depth of field. So uh, we know from uh, close-up photography that when, when you have photography of small things, typically there's a shorter depth of field. And so things in the distance very quickly look, look out of focus. So that, that already gives you a sense of uh, something being small. Uh, another visual trick is a uh, camera angle. So uh, looking down at, at uh, steep angles or looking up uh, indicates, indicates scale. Uh, also camera motion, how fast the camera moves tends to indicate uh, scale. 
but but all of these visual cues are uh, not as effective in a film like Trolls, in which it's a fantasy world, and so uh, you don't have a good ability to judge what size something is supposed to be. So, for example, in the in the first Trolls film, and I'll be mostly talking about the first Trolls film. Um, uh, I'll say a few things about the about the second one that just came out, uh, but I'm mostly talking about. world, how do you know that the trolls are not human size and the Bergen are actually 30 foot giants? So you need other things that tell you whether something is large or small. And fortunately, there, there are a number of other um, physical um, characteristics that, that indicate uh, scale. Uh, one of the, one of the simplest ones to sort of understand is timing. And, and here's a, a simple example of timing under gravity. So let's say that I drop an object from a height equal to its diameter, and I determine how much time it takes for the object to reach the ground. Uh, and by the way, um, because animators think of time in terms of frames, uh, everything here is listed not in terms of seconds, but in terms of frames. So uh, feature film uses 24 frames per second. So um, six frames is a quarter of a second. So a bowling ball drops a distance equal to its diameter in six frames, a baseball in, in three frames. So if you see an object falling a distance equal to its diameter in three frames, then you have a sense of scale that it's a baseball and not a, a bowling ball. So for uh, trolls, because trolls are um, 16 times smaller in scale, and because timing under gravity um, uh, goes as the square of the, uh, of the time is the distance, so motion occurs about four times faster for trolls. So for example, if, if a troll drops an apple from shoulder height, uh, it hits the floor in only three frames, whereas for us, it's uh, 12 frames. Now, this idea that, that timing gives you a sense of scale, uh, this has been used for a long time in, in movies uh, in the use of scale models in, um, uh, well, like in this example from the, the first Terminator movie. So the uh, first Terminator movie was back in 84. So they, they use very few uh, computer generated effects. So they have a, a, in the film a big uh, tanker truck explosion. And uh, the way they, they did it, sorry, I have a cat that is clawing behind me. So I may be interrupted from moment to moment. Uh, so, but anyway, getting back to this. So what they did is they built a scale model and blew that up. You film it with high-speed cameras, and uh, it looks like it's actually a full scale, a full size uh, truck. Uh, we did um, something like this uh, for Madagascar Three. So in Madagascar Three, there's a scene where there's a, a long chain of animals uh, hanging from the bottom of a plane and swinging back and forth, and we want to to get a sense of what the timing of that would be. So we took a two foot chain and filmed it uh, six times uh, slow motion timing. That gives you a, a scale factor of 36 times. And so that, that guided the animators for uh, what this uh, would look like in, in real life. Uh, you know, if you had a 72 foot chain of monkeys with a hippopotamus and a giraffe and a lion and a zookeeper. Uh, a related sense of uh, scale that you get from timing is uh, when things are walking. So uh, the natural cadence of a pendulum swing in walking, uh, well, a pendulum that's four times longer uh, swings in, uh, takes twice as long to swing, and that's pretty much 
independent of angle, it's a small angle. Uh, so in the in the and I'll show you a clip from Star Wars here where you where you see that effect. Uh, the now although something with a long leg has a slow cadence, uh, having long legs you take long strides, and so uh, your walking speed is actually uh, faster uh, than the walking speed of something with with short legs. Um, so here's, uh, here's one of the good Star Wars films. Uh, the, and, and just watch the, um, these walkers, and you see they have a very slow uh, cadence. Uh, now, in this film, this, this was not computer generated. They use uh, scale models that they filmed uh, in, um, with high-speed cameras. And so this is just in slow motion. Uh, but you see that uh, Luke Skywalker there, he has to run at full speed just to catch up to this thing. So even though it has a, a slow cadence, it actually um, has a, a fast speed. Um, I wanna show you, uh, I don't wanna spoil the movie in case you haven't seen it, but uh, you see that's not computer generated. So look at the timing of how it falls. Uh, so that timing of how it falls gives you a sense that it's a, it's a giant machine. Uh, so uh, for trolls, in terms of, of walking and, and such, the trolls have a brisk uh, walk, but not a fast uh, walking speed. Um, and, and we see that in the, in the film, the timing of how trolls move around is much brisker than the timing of, of the um, human size uh, burg. Now there's another, there's a bunch of other things that we can uh, determine about uh, trolls if we imagine them as uh, small mammals that are some, somewhat like a pygmy marmoset or a mouse, uh, but, but also have some characteristics of, of humans. And this is useful because there are many features about an animal that are predicted just from its size. And this principle is uh, known as allometry. So like in, in this uh, graph here, like, so uh, here you see a mouse uh, has a heartbeat that's in this range of like, uh, I think about 500 uh, beats per minute. Uh, so, uh, so any small creature would have this kind of a, of a heartbeat and that, that a uh, heartbeat tells you gives you a sense of its um, uh, what the basically how it uh, would how much food it would uh, would consume its uh, constitution uh, many things that that are predictable uh, from the size of, of an animal and the reason this the reason this works is there are many features which uh, are either dependent on uh, area or volume. And I'll, and I'll show you a bunch of, of examples of this. And because area uh, scales as the square of the size and volume is the cube of the size, uh, then they, as things get larger and smaller, uh, these uh, quantities vary at different rates. Uh, and, and as I said, I'll show you a lot of examples here. Uh, so uh, for example, body weight, um, if uh, have something which is uh, three times uh, larger or smaller, then its body weight is 27 times larger or smaller. So uh, my, my cat is um, you know, maybe three times smaller than, uh, than I am, but it's 27 times uh, smaller weight. So it's, this is more like the cat size kind of creature. And, and of course, trolls are even smaller than that. Uh, and this is significant because um, uh, bone strength uh, does not go as the volume of a bone, but rather the cross-section uh, area of the bone. So um, uh, bone scale as air, bone strength scales as area, or as um, body weight of the animal scales as the volume. And for that reason, and this was actually observed by by Galileo. Uh, or pointed out by Galileo, I should say. Uh, 
small animals tend to have uh, thin bones and uh, their uh, skeletal fraction is a smaller fraction of their total weight as compared to large animals have um, large thick bones. Another feature of small animals is uh, because of this, they, they tend to have a crouching, um, crouching posture uh, more often than, than large animals tend to have to stand up more straight, uh, like horses and, and cows and such. Uh, this was a feature which was uh, rejected for the film. They did not want to have the trolls be more realistic uh, and crouching like, uh, like mice uh, because it, you know, they didn't feel that was appealing. So. But one thing that they did use, which is related to this, is uh, relative stiffness. So you see here, there's a, there's a thread, a string, and a rope. And those um, uh, are made of similar materials, but uh, you see that the relative stiffness is, is different. The, the rope hangs almost straight down from its weight. Uh, unlike the, the thread. And uh, that factors into the clothing for the, for the troll. So the, the clothing will tend to be uh, stiff as, um, as, as doll clothing would be, even if it's made from, from normal materials. And so the, the kind of, and, and CF, CFX means uh, character effects, and that's the uh, how how like clothing uh, looks and is animated uh, for characters. So you won't have uh, flowing robes or um, this this kind of um, uh, more fluid motion that you would see in in uh, human sized clothing. Uh, troll clothing would be would be rather stiff um, uh, relatively, and and that's something which was appears appears in the film. Uh, related to this is uh, for hair. Uh, hair, uh, for just straight hair, uh, Kirchhoff theory uh, for um, elastic beams tells you there's a, a relative stiffness factor, this beta, and this beta uh, depends on the elasticity of the material and uh, the weight of the beam. So when uh, beta is large, then the hair uh, tends to just stick out straight. So this happens with short and stiff hair. Uh, but when beta is uh, small, then the hair can't uh, stay stiff. It goes through a buckling transition and looks, looks more like that. Um, if the hair is curly, then we have another parameter, which is the relative curliness. Uh, and so we have other, uh, types of uh, patterns. So short, curly hair tends to be curly all the way to the head, uh, whereas uh, long, curly hair is uh, straight for a while because the curls are pulled out under the weight of gravity. And then uh, closer to the ends, it, it has uh, uh, more curliness. Uh, but trolls, because of their small size, they are always in this um, upper regime. So we would expect troll hair to either be very, um, very straight uh, and stiff, or if it is curly, then it's, it's curly um, all the way uh, from, the, from the head to the, to the tip. And in the film, both the, the first film and the second film, the, the hair of the trolls is actually uh, physically uh, very real realistically done uh, in many cases. Uh, however, there are there are certain shots where uh, the hair just is like magical. So the um, the troll hair is is very exceptional, and especially in the in the first film, they wanted it to to be more of a, a magical thing that that the trolls could do is would be to to control their hair. So it's a little bit less of that in the in the second film. Another thing which is is different in your world if you're small is that surface forces like surface tension of a liquid 
or stiction uh, between solid surfaces is, is very uh, significant at uh, small scales. Uh, we see this in the, in the first film in, the, in a scene, Branch uh, easily climbs up a fabric uh, curtain. Uh, so his, his weight is small compared to the um, uh, stiction he gets from um, just grabbing things. And then for water, water would be very sticky to, to trolls. The uh, liquid uh, drops, uh, you know, liquid would, would clump into drops. Uh, trolls would not easily be able to drink. Um, they'd be very poor swimmers because of the, um, the surface tension. So uh, very poor surface swimmers. They'd be just fine as, as uh, fish swimming, but it'd be very hard for them to do surface swimming. Uh, and for that reason, they actually, in, in both the, especially in the first film, but also in the second film, uh, they avoid having uh, trolls interacting with water. Uh, in the, there's a little bit more water in the second film, but in the first film, there's only one shot in which there's, there's any water, and, uh, and in that one, uh, it's not very realistic, but it's very, uh, very quick shot anyway. If you're small, then uh, things burn quickly and they dissolve quickly. This is another aspect of uh, area versus uh, volume. So the um, rate of burning depends on the um, on the area and the the amount that has to be burned depends on the on the volume. So uh, this um, this was used in the uh, film as I'll show you in a moment. So, uh, but just to just put some uh, sense of the, the timing, uh, for a human, a match would take about 30 seconds to burn. Uh, a match, a troll sized match would be about two seconds. And you realize that um, for trolls, a human sized match is uh, close to the size of a of a log in a fireplace. So, um, if a log burns for an hour in the fireplace, then it's only uh, a couple of minutes for a for a troll. Uh, and this is this is used in the first film where uh, Branch throws Poppy's guitar into a fire, and the the guitar burns completely in in a matter of seconds. Another thing which is different if, um, if you're small is you have uh, no fear of falling because uh, you never reach a very high speed. Your, your maximum falling speed, uh, because, of, because air resistance depends on, on area and um, uh, you reach a maximum speed when the force of air resistance balances your weight, uh, squirrels never fall faster than about 25 miles an hour which is not fast enough to kill them. Um, cats, it's kind of marginal. They, they uh, die from about half, about half the time from falls at their uh, maximum terminal velocity. Uh, humans almost, almost always. Uh, so, um, so trolls like, like squirrels and other small animals have absolutely no fear of heights because they, they can't die uh, from from heights, their maximum falling speed is just a few miles per hour. It's even small, uh, even slower than squirrels. Uh, so, in fact, we see this in the in the first film. The uh, trolls live in trees. They're they're perfectly uh, safe living in trees, and uh, there's lots of scenes where we see them falling with with absolutely no fear um, of of falling from heights. Uh, one one last thing now. I'm just showing you a, a selection of um, topics, so there, there are many, many more, but um, uh, just to mention one last one, the uh, food consumption, uh, the caloric energy required is also one of these ratios of, of area to, to volume, so uh, small animals eat a large fraction of their, of their body weight. Um, we also do that when we're in quarantine. We're, Eat a large fraction of our body weight, uh, but but just you know with with animals 
you have a sense of uh, their size by how much they eat. So, uh, so I did the calculations and I estimated that trolls would eat about only about 10 calories per day, which doesn't sound like much, but that would be 16 Big Mac uh, meals. I mean, troll sized Big Mac meals. And, and they would probably eat 24 of these uh, per day. So they would be eating constantly. Uh, and, and similarly, they'd be big, big drinkers too. Uh, there's um, very little eating or drinking in, in either of the films. Uh, there is one scene where Poppy eats a berry and, and she just eats it like it's a, a quick snack, even though it's like almost half the size of her head. So uh, anyway, that's the uh, that's the selection of um, effects that that I I wanted to show you. There were uh, many more, and, and I said some of them made it into the film and uh, were. Have useful ideas for the uh, uh, producers and, and for the for the artists, uh, and that's that's usually been my um, role in consulting with with studios is to uh, show them things. You know, this is how it is in in the real world. Uh, would this be would this be useful in the story that you're that you're telling in the, in your film? So. Uh, so anyway, that was that was as I said primarily for the uh, the first Trolls film. The the new one just came out, and of course, uh, it, this was exceptional because the theaters are all closed. So it, it has actually uh, come out um, on video or, or on streaming, I should say, uh, even without appearing in theaters. So just let me leave you here with just a quick little performance. Oh, is it not playing? Well, I could, I could sing, but I, I'm not as good as, uh, as these folks. So uh, anyway, it's a super fun film. So I hope you, hope you guys uh, have a chance to see it soon. Anyway, thanks a lot. Uh, Everybody stay safe and um, I'll be happy to take a, a couple of questions. Thanks, Alex. I don't think anyone will ever look at a troll the same way again. <laughs> so um, we're gonna open it up for questions. Um, and what I'd like to do is um, take the host prerogative and ask you the first question. <laughs> And I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, and what I'll ask um, the other people to do is, um, if you go down to um, the participant button at the bottom of your screen and click that, uh, let's see, you should be able to raise your hand. Let's see. Um, I'm going to ask a someone on this list to do that. Uh, Bem Kaiko, can you please try to raise your hand? I want to see if it works. There we go. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to allow Bem to talk and confirm to us how she was able to, uh, how she was able to um, make that happen. Yeah. I clicked on the hand. <laughs> so there's a hand right next to your name on the speaker we, or on the participant? No, it just, we don't actually have the list of participants. I can't see it. Oh, okay. Uh, I wasn't uh, sure how the right it was. It's a chat, a hand, and a Q&A. Oh, okay, so it's down at the bottom of the screen. At the bottom of the screen, in the middle. Okay. Thank you, Bem. All right, so we're going to, um, I'm going to mute Bem again. And, uh, okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you have a question, please raise your hand. But I'll start with the first question. So I've always been fascinated with um, what it must have been like for astronauts to walk on the moon. Uh -huh. And the main reason for that um, is, is uh, highlighted by two of the features you mentioned really early in the talk, which were um, that in order to figure out scale, um, it's useful to have objects of familiar size in your field of view. Um, and it also helps to judge distances to um, have an atmosphere because the atmosphere tends to uh, blue things and you get that kind of hazy feeling in the distance. 
Um, so I've always wondered whether uh, when you see a film um, portraying astronauts on the moon, whether it's a real depiction of how it felt to them to walk around there. And if you were directing a film about people walking around on the moon, say a very small number of people in only a, a single oddly sized spacecraft, how would you, uh, how would you address the issue of scale? Oh, how to create a, a sense of what the, that scale is. Right. Yeah, yeah, you'd have to, you'd have to play some kinds of tricks of, of introducing things in the scene of, of, a, known, of a known size. Right. Or, or some expectation, but, but it's tough because there, not only do you not have an atmosphere, but also the gravity is, mm -hmm. is different. Right. And so um, uh, this was actually uh, a, well, a challenge which was poorly met in uh, John Carter, uh, which is supposed to take place on Mars. And, and there uh, at one point, in, early in the film, when John Carter arrives on Mars, uh, he has trouble moving around because the gravity is so much lower. And so he, he jumps a lot. In the, and then they completely forget about that for most of the film. Uh, objects fall at their normal gravitational speed. Uh, so they, uh, they, they, they were inconsistent in, in treating the, the gravity with... Um, uh, throughout the throughout the film, uh, but to get back to your your question about in in space with the absence of um, atmosphere to give you those those cues and and also um, yeah things like like light and shadow uh, are all messed up right. and then the gravity is messed up so you can't like show the distance of something by by throwing a rock and seeing how far that that goes. So you have to put, I would say, uh, you would want to put objects in the scene of a, of a given size. So mm -hmm. maybe, maybe put a, a crashed spaceship that's, right. that you know the size of it and, it, and it's in the distance uh, or, or something, something along those lines. But it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, a big, it's a big challenge. Maybe that's why we don't, we don't see a scene like that in, in many places. And it must have been the case when the the first astronauts were on the moon um, that they, um, you know, they didn't have any sense of scale, right? Very difficult to judge how far you've traveled or how big something is for exactly this reason. Yeah. And they don't get a, a, a studio to, to set it up for them. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm going to go to uh, the next hand, which is Mark Marley. Um, Mark, I just... Let me see. Uh, I just unmuted you. Okay. Well, you, you know, your question about the moon reminded me of a question that I often get about exoplanets in that what would it look like on, say, the surface of a planet or the atmosphere, the surface pressure is, say, 10 bars, um, or the star is a different color than the sun. And you could work out you know, the radii of transfer and do all the math and the Rayleigh scattering. But I'm curious if the animation engines are able to do that. Are they able to say, okay, the atmosphere is 10 times thicker, and so here's what the you know, Rayleigh scattered skylight with sky would look like? Or is that just all directed? In other words, how much physics goes into it? Okay, I can, I can tell you that specifically uh, because I was, I was asked to consult on a, um, a game engine. Uh, so the Electronic Arts, a lot of their games are uh, built using the Frostbite engine. Uh, this is the, uh, I think like Call of Duty and some of these other, other games. Uh, so this, this is for um, the, the game, but the other, other engines for um, uh, animation are very similar. So in that one, uh, they, they they called me in because in the engine, there are all of these uh, parameters that you can set for the atmosphere. And in fact, they have, they have separately me scattering and Rayleigh scattering uh, as, as they, they showed me the control panel for 
all the parameters that, that can be set when you're doing the uh, atmosphere for the planet on which the game is taking place. And this was, they were doing this for a Star Wars game. So they wanted like different kinds of, of planets with different atmospheres and such. Um, and so they, they, they had specifically in there uh, me and Rayleigh scattering uh, and even, even ozone that you could set, you could set the amount of, of ozone and how, I don't know exactly what that was doing in the, uh, in the visuals, but, uh, but they had that. So, uh, and the reason uh, this exists is a lot of modern uh, graphic engines are using increasingly physically realistic models uh, in the, the, you know, 20 years ago, they, were, they would cheat everything, but now they put in the real physical models uh, for um, visuals uh, or, or even in explosions, they, they do more uh, realistic fluid simulations. Uh, one of the, and, and the reason they, they, they called me in was, uh, this was fine uh, for the people who, who actually wrote the software, but the artists that were making the game had no idea what the hell Rayleigh scattering was or me scattering or, or whatever. So, so they asked me to like, you know, explain uh, what, what it was all about and, 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 and so forth. So, so to answer your question that, um, yeah, they, they can actually already, they already have that in their, in their graphics engines. So. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Okay, our next uh, questioner is Miri Van Hoven. So uh, you mentioned some of your suggestions for the Trolls movie that were not accepted, but if you had a couple more favorites that you really wanted them to use that were rejected, I'd love to hear those stories. Uh, okay, well, I mean, some of them I knew were not, were not good and, um, and that they were not going to use. Uh, one of them is that the, the voices of the trolls, uh, I calculated that they would be something like 20 decibels lower than human voices, and they would be four octaves higher. Uh, so, you know, four <laughs> octaves is like from the middle of the middle, middle C on the piano to the last key. Right. The end. So, uh, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I knew they were not going to make those <laughs> those things, and, and uh, I mentioned that to them. Now, now, oddly enough, there was an earlier film uh, made by Blue Sky Studio called Epic, and in that film, they also had these little characters, uh, little little creatures, little people, and uh, these little people live in our world, and we don't notice them because they move so fast and their voices are so high pitched that we can't hear them. Okay, so they, they actually used that somewhat realistically in, in an earlier um, film. And in, and in fact, in one of the earliest uh, storyboarding of, of trolls, they were thinking about having the troll voices be like really uh, so high pitched that the human size uh, characters could not hear them. Uh, and they decided, no, <laughs> this, is gonna, this is gonna drive the audience nuts. So, so they didn't use that. Um, I, I actually, cap oh, well, this was actually from a uh, article in I think Proceeding National, Proceedings of the National Academy, which is uh, about how small animals pee and pee rates and how that scales. Um, they didn't need that either, so. <laughs> yeah. okay. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Miri. Uh, let's see. Our next question comes from Ken Wharton. I'll in, I'll hey. Yes. Uh, hey. Hi, Alex. Um, hey, so after thinking about all of this, about what things would be like physics-wise at a small scale, uh, I assume that you saw uh, some of the uh, Marvel movies with uh, Ant-Man. 
Um, yes. Can you tell me what bothered you most about the physics of, of Ant-Man with, with this in mind? Oh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, well, the, I mean, the, the ability of Ant-Man to grow large and small, uh, that, you know, that all aside, uh, the parts of, parts of Ant-Man, well, number one, Ant-Man seems to be able to, to jump very easily big distances. And and that that part is is kind of kind of okay. Uh, smaller uh, the the height that, that animals can jump when they're small uh, because they they gain so much in terms of, of weight uh, reduction uh, that that makes up for their small legs and, and small muscles. So you know fleas can jump jump quite quite far. But but in Ant Man. Uh, the air resistance would be uh, much too large for him to, to jump uh, as far as he does in, in some of the scenes. So, you know, the fact that he can jump a few, a few feet, actually, you know, insects can do that. But, but to jump all the way across the room, uh, even, even if you throw a spider across the room, it won't, it won't, it just the air resistance is too big. Uh, now, uh, one thing which I had in, in my talk and I, and I took it out was, uh, in um, in the Civil War, uh, Captain America Civil War, they have a scene where Ant Man actually grows to be huge, and um, that one they 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 used motion capture to capture the 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 movement of a person. Okay, uh, I don't know if they used Paul Rudd in that, but but they they had a person you know acting out the scene. They used motion capture. Uh, I, I think it was the the, the kind that's pointless, uh, or not pointless, <laughs> markerless uh, motion uh, capture. So they digitized the motion, and then uh, they did the computer slowing down of the timing, so that you know he he looks like he's a giant because they have slowed down his timing. But they did that by uh, digitally recording him and then slowing it down before they composited the the CG character into the into the film. It's the the scene at the airport. So. And you, that was good. You you like that? Yeah, yeah. No, no, that was good. In fact, uh, I, I, I they knew about uh, how they were supposed to slow it down, uh, but this was this was something that people had known about. You know, having to slow down things. Uh, in order to get, create create a sense of something being big, um, like because they had used that for um, special effects, you know, going back into the even well, even before the '80s, they were doing that, um, like for King Kong, the first King Kong. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. Um, we have a question on the chat. Um, someone asked. Uh, where we can find the YouTube link to that song. What's its title? Oh. Do you know? Oh, oh, if you just do Trolls World Tour soundtrack, uh, just search for on YouTube, uh, Trolls World Tour soundtrack, and you'll, you'll find that. So it's very catchy. Mm -hmm. Great. Can you hear me sing? All right. <laughs> I don't see any other questions uh, on the question list. I'll keep it open for one more minute. Um, but uh, while, um, while I'm waiting for any possible last question, I wanna mention um, that the seminar series is going to continue. Um, we have a speaker next Friday and the Friday after that already on our list. Um, next Friday, um, Amanda Khan, who is a new faculty member in our marine science program down at Moss Landing Marine Labs, and the most enthusiastic person uh, about sponges that you could ever imagine, um, is going to give a talk about her expertise in sponges. If you want to see time-lapse movies of sponges moving around at weird speeds. Uh, is it going to be Square Bob, Bob? Uh, I don't know if it's going to be SpongeBob, but um, they're probably similar size to trolls, so there might yeah. be some interesting physics there. Um, and then in two weeks, uh, Phil Heller from our computer science department is going to give a talk about machine learning and image analysis. 
So um, let's take this opportunity to thank Alex. Uh, I, let's see, maybe I can open up the audio for everyone if they wanna, let's, how do I do this? I'm new to, uh, oh, I know how to do this, hold on. Yeah, I've just unmuted everybody. So uh, let's give, uh, let's give Alex a hand. Maybe they can't, maybe it doesn't work, I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, thank you everyone for coming. And uh, I hope you'll join us again um, next week or in the future. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Adios.